Welcome to our podcast series organized by the Brussels Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. This is part of a series called Mediterranean Mornings, jointly organized by the German Marshall Fund of the United States, AJC Transatlantic Institute and our foundation. At the foundation, we have a clear philosophy and motto. We build bridges, especially between the European Union and the Global South. We are covering a wide range of topics from security to foreign policies, democracy, sustainable development and climate change. We are happy to move forward with our activities in these difficult times, relying on the participation of experts from all over the world. I am Susanna Conrad, Senior Program Manager of the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. I want to introduce you the webinar recorded on April 21st, 2020, titled The Arab Uprisings Under Lockdown – Popular Protests in the Time of the Coronavirus Crisis. In this webinar, we discussed the legacy of new wave of popular protests in the MENA region. Furthermore, we assessed how the lockdown and other emergency policies adopted in countries across the region in the wake of the COVID-19 global health crisis are affecting popular mobilization and demands for accountability. In the discussion have participated Michael Singh, Managing Director at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and Zine Labidin Gebuli, scholar and activist at the Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship of the American University of Beirut, originally from Algeria, moderated by Christina Kausch, Senior Resident Fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. We invite you to listen and visit our Facebook and LinkedIn page for more information. You can find all the links in description. Thanks for your attention. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on the Arab uprisings under lockdown, the Arab uh, uprisings under lockdown, which is uh, jointly organized by the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, AJC, Transatlantic Institute, and the German Marshall Fund. Comparatively little of how much the region is really affected by the COVID-19 uh, due to unreliable data. We do know that uh, as of today, Iran and Turkey are among the top 10 of the uh, gl uh, globally uh, most affected countries in terms of confirmed infections. Um, the governments across the region have adopted a whole no a range of, of, of measures um, to confront the crisis. They have closed borders, they have adopted emergency legislation, they have uh, imposed curfews and lockdowns, um, and notably they have banned public gatherings. Now the question we ask yourselves here in the seminar is, is this death knell to uh, the, to the latest wave of uprisings that were so persistent throughout 2019 um, as uh, regimes take advantage of the sort of legitimization um, um, of a securitization of the public sphere in order to uh, silence dissent for good? Or um, will, the, will this, this silencing uh, be a temporary affair and through the, the likely unfavorable image that the, uh, that the governments and the regions and their low capacity will display in the management of this crisis, uh, will this become a catalyst for even stronger discontent in the ensuing economic crisis that, that will come afterwards and that will very likely uh, uh, even strengthen uh, the tensions that have led to the first wave of uprisings in the first place, so that once the lockdown is lifted, the protests will come back with a vengeance. This is the framing that we're looking at today. And for that, I'm very happy to 
introduce our two terrific speakers today. From Washington, D.C., we have Michael Singh, who is Managing Director at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Hello, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Um, and from Beirut, talking to us today is Zine Labidin Rabouli, who is a consultant with the Asfari Institute at the American University in Beirut and originally from Algeria. Um, before I give the floor to the two speakers for a brief kickoff, um, I'd like to explain to everyone of you um, how we're going to proceed and how you can ask questions. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, you can submit questions on a running basis. You will see below there is a Q&A uh, button. There you can write your questions, uh, which, will, uh, which we will be able to read with your name on it. And, uh, speakers will address some of the questions, probably not all, and not necessarily in the order in which they have arrived. And with that, I'd like to start off with Zine. Zine, how is the situation in Algeria and Lebanon, respectively? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the uh, thanks to the AJC, uh, the GMF, and the uh, Conrad Adenauer Stiftung for the terrific opportunity. And thanks for everybody who's attending this. Uh, what I hope to be an interesting uh, session for them. So I'm gonna stick a bit away from the numbers of deaths and cases of coronavirus in both Algeria and Lebanon because they don't tell the whole story. For me, it's not only a public health issue, a public health crisis, but also a governance crisis. And to get into that, I, I will get into a bit of background on what happened in Algeria and what's happened in Algeria and also in Lebanon. So in Algeria, you, have, you had the protest movement, popular protest movement going on for over a year. Uh, it uh, caused some shifts within the regime, uh, including uh, the resignation of former President Bouteflika on April 2nd after ruling the country for, 20, uh, for almost 20 years, since 1999 to 20, 2019. It also caused the imprisonment uh, of uh, his close ally circle, including two prime ministers, Abdel Malik Sindel and Ahmed Yahya, for corruption charges, and also other prominent figures. And basically, rec most recently, it caused some shift within the military junta ruling the country, uh, effectively ruling the country. So that's basically the fracture, the fracture of the system that we're witnessing in Algeria. Added to that is the economic crisis that we're, uh, the looming economic crisis that we're about to face. Uh, with the rentier economy, most of, the vast majority of Algeria's revenues come from the oil and gas industry. And uh, major significant spending go on the security and defense sector without really some real investments into the research, healthcare, or education sectors. Uh, the prices of oil dropped significantly to below basically uh, $20. That's for the Saharan blend oil, uh, the Algerian oil. And our foreign exchange reserves uh, dropped from $160 billion in 2014 to uh, less than uh, $60 billion uh, by the end of this year, which allows us basically no more than 24 months of imports. Uh, and then the corona happened. Uh, so the corona caused or pushed the protest movement to halt it, to halt its uh, strongest manifestation, which is the weekly demonstrations. Uh, however, we've seen an increase in repression from the system. You have over 50 political detainees uh, currently in jail uh, on false charges. And you basically had yesterday, we had yesterday, the, uh, the Algerian government pushing for some, uh, or actually adopting some uh, new amendments to the penal code uh, to oppress more, uh, to give it uh, more green limits to oppress. And this corona crisis, the way that the Algerian government managed it, and uh, it, it deteriorated an already terrible situation, which is the crisis of trust between the people and the government. Uh, what to expect after the end of the corona crisis? I think uh, it's, it's pretty significant and important how the protest movement decided to stop the protest, but also is working on its self-organization to provide an alternative. Uh, I would expect a potential fall of the government uh, after this crisis, not only because of this crisis, but because of the general political situation. And they would also predict some street pressure uh, post-corona crisis, uh, because even people who voted in the last uh, contested elections in December, 
that brought uh, Abdel Majid Tibun as president of Algeria, do they see that the government can't provide anything? So they will go to the streets, to the streets eventually. Uh, to Lebanon, very quickly as well. So uh, you had the October 17 revolution, which reshaped, or basically it addressed first the deteriorating socioeconomic conditions. And once it, it erupted, it also reshaped Lebanese politics and represented the first pan-Lebanese independent political uprising uh, throughout the country's history, I, I believe. Uh, this revolution caused the, the, uh, the fall of the government led by Saad Hariri, uh, the formation of what seems to be so far uh, a one color basically supported by one political affiliation or wave uh, without any consensus in Lebanon. Uh, this government led by Hassan Diab, uh, Prime Minister Hassan Diab, that is still trying to prove itself. Uh, it also, the October Revolution in Lebanon also caused the fracture of the post-civil war uh, a type agreement based uh, political system. Uh, so basically today it's not uh, a, uh, many Lebanese parties that, that are sectarian that are uh, going to change the country, but it's more of the basically the uh, the, uh, the people who are independent of these all uh, sectarian sentiments. Uh, the what I would say in Lebanon the most dangerous aspect about this crisis is the economic factor. So the first thing to know about the economic uh, the economic crisis in Lebanon it's not led by today's situation. Uh, it's rather the result of decades of policies and mismanagement. Uh, the results are clear today. You have the public debt that, uh, that went from $40 billion in 2007 to uh, $86, dollars, uh, $86 billion in 2019. You have the public debt to GDP ratio at 152%, which is uh, basically the, the third largest uh, rate in the world. You have poverty, uh, according to the World Bank, up to 30%. You have unemployment also up to 20%. And we expect all these uh, numbers to increase uh, within the, with the corona crisis. The dollar, because the dollar in Lebanon is very important. So the currency of the dollar is very important because it's basically, the market is dollarized. Uh, and the official rate set by the BDL, uh, by the Bank Julie Bond, by the central bank is at... Uh, one dollar to fifteen fifteen uh, Lebanese pound today in the informal market it reached the level of three thousand so it's uh, basically the double uh, and they would let you imagine the uh, the uh, the impact of this of all this on the socioeconomic conditions of Lebanese so with the corona crisis what changed uh, the lockdown stopped the street protests uh, but similarly to Algeria Lebanese are also taking some other forms of protesting, like today, for example, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Lebanese parliament was holding a session and they were basically shouted by Lebanese staged uh, car convoys to protest uh, the government. Uh, you had also several spontaneous uh, protests abrupting in, the, uh, in various uh, regions of Lebanon, including in Tripoli. Uh, the people's patience seemed to be ending very soon, which is understandable considering that the many people don't even have what to eat. Uh, so what to expect in light of this condition, I, I think uh, the, probably the resignation of this government by beginning of fall. Uh, the government, when it was established in the first place, it was called the government of collapse. Uh, it's, it's just going to take the hit of the collapse, but then it will resign, in my opinion. Uh, and also the worst socioeconomic crisis in decades in Lebanon. Uh, so basically what I would suggest that are, that are factors to look at in the near future to see the developments in Algeria and, and in Lebanon. First, the government's ability to respond effectively to the post-corona socioeconomic grievances, uh, because if you don't have the government that's going to help, you're going to have people protesting in the streets in very violent ways. Uh, you also have to look at the probability of forming a political alternative. I'm someone who believes that streets bring down governments, maybe, but they don't uh, build states. It's the political alternative that does build the state. So we have to see how the protest movements in Algeria and in Lebanon are moving towards strengthening themselves. Uh, and also one important factor, the last important factor, which is the reaction of the international community. 
uh, it's obvious that no change will happen without the approval or at least the support, the unofficial support of the international community. And how the U.S., the EU will deal with all this, uh, I'm no expert in that, so I would let uh, Michael uh, address that point. So that's about it, and looking forward to hearing your questions. Thanks, Christina. It's a real pleasure to join all of you today. Um, and thank you, Zine, for that great discussion of Algeria and Lebanon. Um, I, I just want to say two things, essentially. One, uh, about the region as a whole and, and perhaps what we uh, can expect as this crisis plays out. And second, how, what kind of reaction we might expect from the United States and the rest of the world. Um, when it comes to the crisis itself, obviously the Middle East is facing two distinct crises, <coughs> excuse me, which have uh, nevertheless become intertwined. One is uh, the global pandemic, the crisis we're all facing. Um, and that obviously has uh, led to a dramatic decline in demand, a dramatic decline in economic activity. Um, and that decline will have very significant repercussions for everyone around the world, um, and some particular repercussions for the Middle East um, that we have already started to see. Um, for example, we can see a, a real diminution in portfolio inflows of capital. Um, we can see a di diminution of remittances uh, flowing to the region as well as from the region, uh, from the Gulf, for example. Um, a decline in tourism, uh, which is a key component uh, of several Middle Eastern economies. Um, in addition to these sort of same types of hits that other economies are taking to GDP, to employment, um, and so forth, and to government finances. And that's compounded, obviously, in the region by the um, oil crisis, um, which is uh, in part uh, the result of policies taken by regional oil producers, um, but not entirely. And that will obviously hit the um, uh, revenues of oil producers in a very significant way. Um, and some are going to be more vulnerable than others. So, for example, I look in particular at a country like Oman, um, which was already dealing with a, a relatively tight situation uh, economically uh, with minimal uh, fiscal buffer and so forth, and not many places to turn for assistance. Um, because if, you, if they turn to assist for assistance to, say, Gulf states, which have assisted Bahrain, um, oftentimes the political conditions are uh, too onerous or, or simply unacceptable for the Omanis who have tried to preserve uh, a degree of political neutrality uh, in their region. Um, what we don't know, I think, those, those things are relatively predictable, the economic consequences. Um, and I think we can say that it, this crisis will be more severe for the Middle East than, say, the financial crisis was, in 2008, um, insofar as the Middle East is just more exposed to the type of uh, crisis that we're seeing now than it was to that particular crisis. What we don't know is how this economic crisis will translate in political terms. And of course, that will be different uh, from place to place. Um, you know, it's, uh, Zine has already talked about Lebanon and Algeria. Um, if we look at the experience of the Arab Spring, um, some would argue that there were political repercussions, but they were delayed, that the political repercussions lagged the economic problems by several years. So you had a financial crisis in 2008 um, and then uprisings in 2011. That, that is contested by some. Um, but I think it's um, reasonable to say that there, the political implications will lag the economic crisis by different degrees in different places. Um, initially, of course, people will be more focused on economic survival um, of course, you know, people are probably reluctant to come out into the streets even and, and to congregate. Um, but in the future, we might see um, greater political repercussions. And I'd be very surprised if we didn't see severe political repercussions. I, I think that what is um, far less clear this time around uh, than it was during 2011 is the regional and international reaction uh, to those types of events. Um, regional in part because the big regional powers that ordinarily might be inclined to intervene one way or the other will perhaps be facing their own economic difficulties as a result of the oil price uh, crisis. Uh, and simply because um, we have, I think since 2011, um, seen a kind of change in the regional dynamics, um, less unity, for example, amongst uh, GCC countries, more rivalry among, say, um, the Turks and some of the Gulf countries. Uh, and so there is a different regional dynamic, and it's tough to know exactly how that will play out um, in this kind of uncertain environment that we're facing. It's also tough to know how the international community will react. What we're seeing, I think, initially as a result of this pandemic from the big powers 
is not uh, an inclination to reach out and help in significant ways, but to first focus, as one might expect, on helping themselves, because obviously they're facing a crisis at the same time. Um, and if you look at the rhetoric in the United States um, uh, right now, it's very much focused on how do we promote our own economic resilience in the face of not just uh, viruses, but in the face of, say, uh, countries like China, which are perceived amid this pandemic um, to have acted in a sort of predatory manner. Um, that's obviously a very strong narrative in the United States, but it's also one you'll find uh, in Europe and, and elsewhere. And so the risk, I think, for countries which will be dependent in some degree on external assistance is that there will be this turning inward uh, by Western countries, uh, which otherwise would be the, the surest sources of external support. Um, and I think the other uh, issue that you see um, is that this has affected attitudes towards um, you know, foreign assistance. It's uh, affected the ability of uh, Western nations to work together to tackle these types of problems. Um, and I think, frankly, it has um, sort of blended together with a kind of anti-interventionism, um, which uh, stands in pretty stark contrast to where we were in 2011, uh, that uh, will make uh, Western nations, I think, reluctant to become involved in whatever is playing out uh, in this or that country in the Middle East. Now, the one sort of uh, perhaps countervailing factor, um, which will be, again, interesting to watch and highly uncertain, is uh, the role that, say, Russia and China play in all of this. Um, because while Western countries, in the United States in particular, may be reluctant to act in the region, uh, or just unsure of their ability to act in the region, um, if they perceive that, for example, China is moving to take advantage of some countries' economic vulnerability. Uh, again, I'll use Oman as, uh, as an example. If uh, China were to offer to bail out uh, Oman in the case of economic difficulty, for example, that may be something, given the national security sort of shift to a focus on great power competition, that in fact motivates the United States or Western countries to become more interventionist, more active uh, in helping countries of the region to crowd out those potential rivals. Um, and so you have these countervailing forces, uh, and I think more than anything, you have just a tremendous degree of uncertainty today, both economically, politically, and diplomatically in the region, um, which makes these uh, next few years, um, I think, uh, uh, likely to be pretty tumultuous. Thank you, um, Michael. So um, we have a few questions. I mean, it's great to open this up onto the regional dimension. Let me, before I uh, pick up some, some of the questions that were made in the Q&A, well, I'll repeat to everybody tuning in, please ask your questions via the Q&A box below. Uh, and also mention if you, if you want to direct your the, the question to any of the specific speaker. So, uh, Zine, you mentioned, um, well, you both mentioned the, 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 the slump of the oil price and the impact that has on uh, the state capacity and the resources that the state has, both to confront the crisis um, uh, and and to and to survive in the longer in the long run. So, Dean, could you perhaps say a few words on what well, you mentioned? I think twenty months or twenty four months. Could you say perhaps a little more detail on how that affects the Algerian government and uh, um, um, and its and its state capacity in this COVID crisis? And Zin, I was also thank, wondering. Um, so the two cases you described, they, they are the protest movement in Lebanon and Algeria, the protest movements have in common that they, unlike in 2011, they do not stop at just asking for the, the uh, president or you know, you know, to, to step down, but basically they want systemic change. Um, how likely do you think this is, these kind of systemic demands uh, uh, are gonna come through and um, what, uh, how are they surviving right now that they're under lockdown? Um, are there online activities going on? How do they, so one of the questions in the Q&A was, how do they interact with the regime now that everybody has to stay at home? You, and especially, you mentioned the, that they are leaderless. How does that affect their, you know, their, their cloud right now under lockdown where they basically can only exist online? So I'd like to hear, you know, some details on how, how they are going to hold on to that cause until confinement is lifted again. Um, and Michael, I mean, you underlined the, 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 
you know, the dichotomy of the economic crisis and of the health uh, crisis, I would add to that the third crisis, which is an information crisis. Because as much as governments uh, uh, respond to the, to the coronavirus, they also, uh, you know, they also uh, spread misinformation or try to hold on to information in order to preempt panic and or make their country or not make their country look better than that. Perhaps, um, Zin, can you say something to, on the oil and on the on the digital activities of the Iraq movement and how that engages the government? Thank you for the all great questions. So I'm going to start with the first question of the, uh, the statement on the 24 months of uh, imports. Uh, so basically right now we have less than $60 billion as foreign exchange reserves that are not uh, easily accessible, by the way. Once these reserves are over, because we import use in the foreign currency, we don't import use in the dinar, the national currency. At certain point, the state will no longer be able to import uh, any necessities, including uh, basic necessities like food. So at that point, uh, personally, I would predict that the Algerian government would go for austerity measures before reaching that point. But if we do, and if we reach that point without uh, uh, any austerity measures, I believe we will have to ask for foreign debt. Now, the question is, the problem with the foreign debt, who is willing to give a corrupt state or corrupt government uh, with a dysfunctional system uh, any sort of money without any serious economic reforms? Uh, if you put aside the IMF, which is uh, obviously not going to engage in such a game, uh, you will have China remaining. But even then, it's, it's very questionable how the Algerian government will convince its international partners to help it financially. Uh, and that's basically the formula for social explosion, by the way. Uh, how, will li how likely will the demands uh, come true? I think we reached a point in the MENA region, at least, uh, or especially in Lebanon and Algeria, the systems are here, but they are ruling, not governing. They are dysfunctional. They are here to represent the state, but they are not here to address the social, the socioeconomic grievances of the people. Uh, so eventually, the change will happen. The only question for me, what sort of, or what shape will that change take? Whether it will be a peaceful one, sustainable one, or will it be dangerous, risky, and bloody? That's the question. And whether it will end with a real democratic state or will, will it end with a, with a state of chaos? Uh, that, that's, that's, that's my perspective. So uh, the online activities, uh, so basically it, after the movement stopped in Algeria and even in Lebanon, uh, people went to the, to the, to the social media reminding each, reminding each other about why they started this movement in the first place. Uh, they raised awareness about the political detainees issue. Uh, they even, I, I saw even some suggestions on uh, relative to specific sectors in Algeria, reforms that are es essential to these, to these sectors. And people were debating. They, they were setting up uh, live uh, Facebook streams and uh, discussing. People were hanging uh, pictures and, uh, and flags uh, on, the window, on the windows. So basically on Fridays to keep the movement going. And this kind of social media mobilization prom prompted more police repression. Before, we used to see the Algerian government uh, arresting people because they were protesting. Today, they are arresting people because they posted something on Facebook that might uh, criticize the Algerian government. I would disagree with the, with the statement of the movement is leaderless. I don't think the movement is leaderless. I think it's asymmetrically uh, led. So it's not led by public figures. It's not led by uh, these uh, great activists in the, in the, in the, on the ground. It's rather led by certain organizations. So it's basically a set of organizations, NGOs, assemblies, unions that are in a way uh, pushing the streets and that are kind of shaping the demands of the streets. And now you have the masses, for sure, but you also have those leading the masses. Uh, so I guess it's not leaderless, as, as many have said over the past months. It certainly started so in February, but starting, I guess, from April, May, it started getting a bit organized at the very basic level. We're not talking about leadership in the, on the national level. I think that requires more time, but certainly on the basic level, we have some sort of organization. Is, was there a question that I didn't answer? No. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
I'm going to pick up some of the questions that have been asked here. Um, so there's several questions relating to basically asking about how likely do you both see it that the governments will be able to hold on to those emergency legislation, will be able to, to, to make these changes that are being implemented under the heading of the health crisis permanent after the crackdown. Uh, after the, uh, the, the, the lockdown, so no, how likely do you think that, these, that the measures that the governments are right now taking to confront the COVID crisis are going to be entrenched and are going to be lasting uh, beyond the confinement, beyond the actual health, public health crisis? Do you think governments in the region are in a good position to do so, or do you think the weight of the public anger of the protests will be, will be stronger? Well, look, I mean, we, as much as I am reluctant to say it, I think that what we've found in the region over time is that when, you know, quote unquote emergency measures are put in place, um, they tend to stick around for a long time, especially when they're measures intended to control uh, the population. Um, and so uh, I think there is a risk that any kind of emergency measures uh, will persist. Now, whether um, they're able to do so in the face of popular protest. Uh, I think is a, is a different question, and, and I think there, it's too uncertain right now to say um, what kind of popular protests we'll see in, in these countries, if any. Um, but I, I do wonder, though, if um, if we had a second round of protests like we had in 2011, whether you wouldn't see sort of um, a different kind of reaction from governments in the region. Um, I think that you've probably had some learning which has gone on, especially from authoritarian governments, uh, as to how to um, suppress these kind of protests. Um, uh, we already saw that, I think, in 2011, 2012, with the Arab Spring, as the protests sort of moved from one country to another. Um, and so, so I don't think that um, you'll see governments as uh, inclined in many places to make accommodations with popular protests. And Michael, just follow up. Do you think that if that happened, that the United States government, for example, would be willing to support those protests? Well, I think that there's a narrative in the United States um, and in the region that the U.S. was too quick um, in some places to, to act. I think that includes Egypt, uh, where there's a sense that the United States was too quick to throw aside or to throw under the bus, as we say, uh, the sort of allied government of Hazi Mubarak, even though we recognize, frankly, a lot of the uh, major flaws with that government. Um, too quick, perhaps, to um, even intervene in Libya, despite uh, the humanitarian case for doing so, um, especially given uh, the way things have progressed in Libya so far. All those are, of course, contested, um, especially by people who are involved in the decisions. Um, but I think there's simply, uh, overall, far less appetite uh, for that kind of either diplomatic or uh, especially military uh, intervention than there was in 2011. I think in 2011, um, the Obama administration had a view that uh, the Iraq war was uh, the wrong kind of intervention, but that there still was a right kind of intervention. Uh, I'm not sure that these days there's a view that there's any right kind uh, of intervention, um, but there's more of a kind of quasi-realist approach that says, look, we are not able to um, sort of capably or sort of competently affect through these interventions the, the course of events in these countries. Um, instead, we're, we're best sort of dealing with reality as we find it. Um, I think that that's a very powerful uh, now sentiment, not just in the United States, but elsewhere, given the course of, uh, of events in some of these places. Thank you, Michael. Another question. Um, how do the speakers see Islamist movements acting in this situation? Um, do they fill some of the void left by the state in the fights? Well, actually, I would, I would broaden this question from Islamist to uh, civic, non-governmental non, non uh, actors uh, more broadly. I think, uh, Zim, perhaps with, but this is particularly interesting in the, Libya, in the Lebanese case, isn't it? Or please, uh, any other case that you might find relevant. It certainly, it certainly is. I, th I think uh, with the protest movements, whether in Lebanon or in Algeria, they put that the state is incapable of, of assuming its, uh, its constitutional duties, by the way. And it's now the, the civil society that is leading the, the way. It's not the government that is taking care of anything. In Lebanon, for example, they wanted to spend, uh, to give 400,000 Lebanese pounds, which is the equivalent in the black, black market of $150 or less, to uh, to uh, to disadvantaged families until today there is no news because the the list has to be scrutinized again by the Lebanese army 
So I, I think it's very interesting to see how the, how the civil society is reorganizing itself to, to, to help the, uh, not, not even help the government, to play the role of the government at this point. So if you would allow me just, Christina, to answer some questions. Uh, the first one from Mrs. Uh, Marie uh, Camberlin on the, uh, on the amendments to the penal code in Algeria. So basically uh, what they say is that they criminalize fake news and hate speech. Uh, the, 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 the audience cannot see the questions, so maybe, perhaps can you say that what uh, the yeah. question is before you answer? Thank so, you. So, so basically, Mrs. Marie asked about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the amendments to the penal code, the Algerian penal code, and how this could be translated in restrictive measures. So the penal code, the amendments were supposedly to promote peaceful dialogue and to basically put an end to fake news and hate speech, but uh, we kind of I, I, I could know but this, by this point that is that they will use it to track down activists uh, online who say something that is contradictive to, 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 the, to the system's narrative. And, and, and that's the, uh, the scary part about this, uh, these, these amendments. How is the, from Mr. Assam, how is the Hirak planning to engage with the new government? Well, I first, first I think that the Hirak will not be able to engage with the, with the government unless it organizes, like, unless it has a political alternative. Uh, the generals rule in Algeria will not sit with 40 million Algerians to discuss the uh, the, uh, uh, to, the, to discuss the, uh, the, uh, the Algerian case, but they will sit with uh, with the movement if it organizes itself in a clear way. Uh, and what would we expect from this engagement? I think nothing but uh, uh, agreeing on the terms of the, of the departure of the system. So I may get the chance to answer more questions, but uh, I let it to uh, Mike now. Uh, Michael, do you want to say something about the question on the Islamists and on the <clears throat> non-state actors that might find new ground to act within the... Sure thing. I, I think we have found in the region, um, and frankly not just this region, but uh, more broadly, that where we see a sort of uh, vacuum or failure of governance, uh, a failure to provide services and so forth, there are these kind of uh, non-state or quasi-state actors um, that are uh, often ready to fill that void in a manner of speaking. Um, and for better or worse, oftentimes these uh, actors are armed actors that establish their preeminence through force um, rather than, say, um, you know, NGOs or, or purely civil society groups. It's not true everywhere, um, but I think um, there's enough prominent examples of it to make it a big concern, especially uh, in this region where we've seen it in Lebanon with Hezbollah, we've seen it in Syria and Iraq with the emergence of ISIS uh, and so forth. Um, this is in fact, um, you know, one reason why um, uh, as, as an international community, um, we should be um, trying to promote good governance uh, in these places. Uh, we should be trying to promote um, strong, resilient states in, in these places. You know, unfortunately, that's something I think is best done between crises um, and before crises uh, and is much more difficult to do during crises. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, I hate to say it, but again, now I think we will uh, find ourselves paying the price for our lack of attention to these issues um, uh, really in the, in the past several years. Um, because, you know, a large part of uh, what I said last time that these issues had fallen out of favor, we had uh, uh, decided that our capability of affecting uh, these matters was not uh, very robust. Um, and, uh, and so we might find ourselves wishing we had uh, paid a little more attention. Well, what you just said, that had we just paid more attention to this matter, that seems like the periodic uh, uh, remark that comes only on every few years, no? sadly. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the um, about the the refugee vulnerable refugees uh, in that are you know in a particularly uh, vulnerable situation uh, and of course the state capacity of failed states to uh, to confront this crisis. What about uh, Libya, um, um, Syria, Yemen, and perhaps to my degree uh, Gaza? Uh, how are states that have little to no capacity uh, at all with shattered sanitary health systems uh, and, and, uh, and uh, a population in Dara said, how are they supposed to protect themselves uh, from this uh, from situation? What is the international community doing about this? Um, how are we even supposed to know 
um, how far the spread in these in these places has gone. Any remarks? I mean, these are rhetorical questions, yep. but any remarks you might share on this on this issue? Well, look, I think it's an important question, and unfortunately, we see this compounding effect because amid this kind of crisis. Um, you, first of all, are likely to have more refugees because refugees are, of course, not uh, only created by war, but they're also created by economic dislocation and so forth. Um, those refugees are likely to have greater needs because, of course, you know, the baseline um, health situation for a refugee population, like the refugees who are um, stuck north of Idlib on the Turkish border, uh, who are in places like Rukban and so forth, um, is already lower, obviously, than that of uh, the general populace. And so they're more likely to be uh, significantly affected, for example, by a virus outbreak um, because they lack the ability to do the things that many of the rest of us are doing, like social distancing or practicing good hygiene uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and yet the appetite for and resources to help them probably diminish. Um, so you, as I mentioned before, have uh, probably lower uh, foreign assistance budgets uh, in the wake of this kind of crisis simply because other needs, other priorities rise in importance. And I think also one thing we've seen as a result of the rising sort of populism and nationalism around uh, the world, especially in the West, um, is a growing skepticism of the international organizations that exist to provide services to these refugees. So in the United States, for example, uh, funding for UNRWA, uh, the UN Relief and Works Agency that provides services to Palestinian refugees was cut uh, entirely, and that's a very significant portion of UNRWA's budget. Um, they had managed to scrape money together since the U.S. Uh, budget cut, but will they be able to do that in this environment? Um, that's much harder to see. Um, you could say the same for the um, UN uh, Refugee Agency you could probably say the same for, uh, you could certainly say the same for the World Health Organization. As we know, uh, obviously, the U.S. has indicated it will cut funding for that uh, body as well. And so these, uh, all these factors together, I think, mean that these populations will be in a very difficult circumstance with neither the host governments uh, willing or able or the international community willing or able uh, to provide for them. Um, and that, that's a, a bleak assessment, but I, uh, I'm, I regret to say it's probably the, the accurate one. Uh, I think so. I, I will talk about the Lebanese case and then basically use it as to, gener to generalize a bit on the other war zones in the region. So even before this crisis, the Lebanese government had already announced that on its own it cannot uh, take care of the, of the refugee crisis, whether they are the Palestinians or, or the Syrians. Uh, they have largely used uh, international support, uh, mainly by the UNHCR. Uh, so I think the question today, who they, they are obviously, the refugees are obviously enduring a lot of suffering, and that's uh, nothing to uh, basically to elaborate on. I, th I think everybody knows the disastrous situation of the refugees, uh, uh, specifically in the, in the MENA region. But I think this this is not only this is not a responsibility to only the state or mainly to the state. It's a responsibility to the international community. It has the tools, it has the organisms, and it has the capability to address this issue. Uh, and if the international community is still hoping that uh, Lebanon on its own or Jordan on its own or or uh, Libyans on their own or Yemenis on their own could find solutions to to these crises. I'm, I'm afraid they cannot, not because they don't want to, but because they don't have the tools to do so. Uh, so I think the intervention of the international community, or at least the support of the international community, uh, in this matter is very, 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 very crucial, actually. So if you allow me just, Christina, to answer a question related to this, the role of the international community. So what, what I've been seeing, uh, basically two or three questions, based on what could the international community do to support the protest movement or to support the government, uh, especially the one in Algeria, to, to defend and protect human rights. So, first of all, uh, the, the, how the international community could save Lebanon and could save Algeria is very different. In Lebanon, they need mostly uh, financial aid, which I think will come at a certain point with the help of the IMF at certain conditions. But in Algeria, with the, with the human rights situation, in particular, uh, well, Algerians are obviously against uh, foreign intervention, but they are not against uh, international support. That, that's, a, that's a distinction. So you don't have 
as an international community to say, let's bring down the government. But you could say, for example, let's support the Algerian people and let's support the rights. And especially that the European Union, for example, has, uh, has uh, several uh, agreements with the Algerian uh, uh, state uh, since, I guess, 10 to 15 years. Uh, and it allows uh, the European Union some, some window of opportunity to speak on human rights violation. So I think what the response of the international community to Algeria should be as following. You obviously have to engage with the Algerian government because you need the state's representation. But you don't have to agree with the Algerian government, nor do you have to endorse the repression of human rights in Algeria to do that. So maintain that fine line between working with the state officials, but also uh, reminding them that there is a, an issue of human rights and reminding the whole world that in Algeria there is an issue. So I think that's how the international community could support the Algerians. In Lebanon, it's mostly financial aid, yeah. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about the openings that come out of this uh, crisis in the region. So um, several analysts have pointed out that uh, how, um, despite lots of conspiracy theories that, you know, uh, um, at the early stages of the crisis that the virus was coming from Iran and deliberately spread around the region, in the end, um, several Gulf states have uh, reached out to Iran and provided humanitarian assistance. Um, at the same time, you've had uh, a strong, uh, tighter collaboration between uh, the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority on jointly tackling the health crisis, health crisis which of course is a matter of necessity. Um, um, some also consider the possibility but that, that this crisis might provide an opening for a U.S.-Iran rapprochement, uh, given that the virus doesn't stop at borders and the, the, the sanctions do not exactly help Iran to tackle this crisis. Um, do you see a real opportunity in any of these, uh, in any of these or do you think this is uh, rather limited to the current health situation? Michael, do you want to chip in? Sure thing. Um, look, I think you're right that we have seen uh, that kind of cooperation both between the Gulf Arab states and, and Iran on the one hand and the Israelis and Palestinians on the other hand. Uh, I am skeptical, though, that these are harbingers of um, sort of greater movement towards rapprochement. Um, you know, in a sense, whenever you read an article about uh, the Gulf Arab states cooperating with Iran in some way, uh, talking to the Iranians, they'll always say it's unprecedented. But uh, the fact that it says every time that it's unprecedented it should tell you that, uh, in fact, this isn't necessarily uh, aberrant behavior, that uh, for the most part, um, the Gulf Arab states in Iran um, have had a kind of um, sort of rough modus vivendi where um, they have um, sort of managed to avoid conflict, find room for cooperation, and so forth. It doesn't necessarily mean that rapprochement is on the horizon. Um, I would say that what more than anything, um, uh, and this is, I think, unfortunate in its own way, has pushed um, these uh, states towards trying to find a, more of a modus of envy with Iran is the sort of disengagement of the United States from the region because um, it sort of takes away uh, something of a sort of security pillar or security blanket, if you were, uh, from U.S. allies in the region and, and perhaps forces them to lean more on regional diplomacy and so forth. Um, that's manifested itself um, in both uh, positive and, I would say, negative ways, because um, it, you could argue that it also leads to more of this kind of uh, infra-regional interventionism, um, which uh, produces uh, not sort of so far diplomatic outcomes, but, uh, but conflict. Um, so I, I do think that um, uh, you're right that we're seeing that. I'm not sure, though, that we'll see um, a movement towards uh, greater rapprochement afterwards. I think that will really depend on circumstances. It will depend on uh, the choices that leaders make um, and so forth. Um, I think that the fundamental um, drivers of the dispute between Iran and the Gulf states still remain things, for example, like Iran's reliance on these sort of non-state actors like Hezbollah, its promotion of, um, you know, sort of uh, splinter groups or terrorist groups within uh, uh, its neighbors as long as Iran is doing those things, I think it'll be difficult to reach any kind of um, broader diplomatic settlement because that settlement will really have to be based upon 
some set of shared principles or norms, um, which right now does not exist. Um, when it comes to the U.S. and Iran, um, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm coming across as so pessimistic and negative here, but uh, I, I think that we will not see, as a result of this crisis, um, a, a movement towards rapprochement. Um, I think that um, a movement towards a negotiation between the United States and Iran really is unlikely before uh, our presidential elections here in the United States in November of 2020, um, either because uh, if you have a Democratic victory, I think you'll, you'll see um, uh, Joe Biden, who would uh, be the president at that stage, um, want to move back towards either the JCPOA or something similar to the JCPOA, um, and would probably want to look to do so quickly because uh, the president of Iran, Hassan Rouhani, um, would only have a limited uh, amount of time left in office at that stage, just a few months, actually. Um, whether that's possible is another question uh, entirely. Um, and if the, President Trump wins re-election, um, then you might see the Iranians uh, finally decide that they need to choose negotiation in a way to alleviate some economic uh, difficulties. Um, but they might choose to do so via a crisis uh, in order to acquire leverage um, or somehow change the terms of the negotiation in the same way that we've seen from, say, North Korea and other states. Um, so that might be a bit of a fraught or perilous path, especially given wild cards like the possibility of Israeli military intervention, which isn't in the control of the United States, per se. Um, you could even argue, though, that, um, in fact, the coronavirus pandemic, um, together with the uh, collapse in oil prices, um, really reduces in a strange way American leverage with respect to Iran because really there isn't any step the United States could easily take right now um, in terms of our own policies that would help Iran tremendously uh, when it comes to their economy. Um, if we were to remove sanctions on oil now, of course, oil is trading at negative prices, and so that's not going to be uh, extremely helpful at the moment. No one's looking to purchase uh, Iranian oil at this stage. Um, and similarly, our ability to stand in the way of things like IMF loans is probably not as great uh, as advertised, but those IMF loans are not going to be the solution for, for Iran in, in any event. So you, you could argue that the pandemic has um, sort of uh, changed. Yeah. Do you think that the United States is going to support the IMF loan that Iran has asked for? No, I don't think the United States will support the IMF loan. That won't necessarily block the loan. Um, but in many cases, similar to this, the United States does not support uh, IMF loans. Um, there's actually a long history of the U.S. Uh, objecting these kinds of loans, not just in the Iran case. Of course, Iran hasn't generally sought IMF loans for a long time, but in other cases as well. Um, so I expect the United States will, will oppose it. Um, but if it's going to fail, I think it'll fail more because um, the Iranians won't provide uh, the necessary information to form the basis of the loan request and less because of uh, U.S. opposition. Thank you. Zine, I have a question for you. What do you expect, and perhaps in relation to Algeria, what role do you ex would you expect or hope for the European Union or the European member, EU member states to take now or in the aftermath of the corona crisis? So, uh, I think... I think personally, I would say that uh, the U.S. is obviously disengaged from the Middle East and Africa at this point, at least with the current uh, President Trump administration. I don't know how it will be with the uh, whether uh, the candidate Joe Biden gets it or it's it's uh, it's President Trump again. I don't know how the U.S. will deal with the Middle East and North Africa. But for Europe, uh, I think it's best place to support the Algerians during this uh, moment. Not only because of our historic uh, alliance, our historic uh, rapprochement with the, Euro with the Europeans, but also because whatever happens in Algeria, whatever happens in Lebanon, whatever happens in Libya, will have repercussions on the, uh, on the European Union. And we've seen with the Syrian crisis what it, what it had brought to, 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 uh, to, to the European Union. Uh, how would they support? I think at this point it's obvious that the Algerian government will endure uh, a terrible economic crisis in the following months, and regardless of how China dealt with the with the with the with this outbreak, regardless of its disinformation, the Algerian government or any government actually in the region will not be asking too many questions about how you dealt with the uh, with the outbreak if you have some money to help. So I think first of all, it's financial help that is needed to prevent the collapse of the state. Uh, 
to prevent that transformation where the people do no longer have only a problem with the government, but also with the state. So the financial help is very important. Also, the human rights help. Uh, I think it's very clear also today that a protest hinder the regime's uh, DNA of repression, but they don't stop it. What stops this repression is an international pressure. And this is where the European Union has a chance to, to engage. Uh, they have to say it very clearly uh, since, I think since the beginning of the movement, I haven't heard uh, the European, any European official making it very, very clear that repression is not acceptable in Algeria. It's unacceptable. They, they need to make it clear to their Algerian counterparts. Uh, regardless whether the system is legitimate or not, it's ruling, and it's here, and it's repressing, and you have to be clear about that. Third, I think in the future, at least the next couple of years or up to 10 years, I think the European Union also has an opportunity to engage with Algeria regarding its democratiz democratization process. Again, it's obvious the system is falling. For me, it doesn't it does the fall of the system doesn't depend on the protest movement. It depends on its own internal clashes, like with the ones we're seeing in the military and also the economic crisis. So the system for me, as long as it does not provide an alternative, as it does not uh, even, uh, it's not even able to renew itself, it will fall. And then you will have, the European Union will have to deal with that, uh, along with the other international community, but the European Union will be the, the main factor in this equation. And I think they have to at least offer some, uh, I wouldn't say guidance, but I would say uh, help, logistical help, uh, whether with the, uh, with the promotion of democracy, uh, as general as that may sound, but it's needed, the help of civil society organizations, uh, the, the capacity building initiatives, I think that's, that would be very, very much needed in the Algerian case. With the picture that you both are drawing, um, Michael, you were talking about the dichotomy of these two, you know, the, the health crisis and the economic crisis. And really, if we look at all the socioeconomic indicators in the Middle East, the state of the state capacity, the capacity of the health system, uh, the information management, um, um, uh, the, 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 the economic situation of the people, the vulnerability of people uh, depending, you know, under the informal workers under lockdown that have to have to be basically decide between hunger and, and, and coronavirus. Um, it really looks as if there's a kind of a perfect storm cooking up there, only waiting to be unleashed when, once the confinement is lifted. Would, would you say that's accurate? Well, you know, look, I, I think that... Um... It's a, it's a tremendously difficult situation because uh, you're right about all the challenges that not just Middle Eastern uh, countries, but many sort of emerging market countries will face in dealing with this virus in terms of their capacity to cope with the types of um, sort of uh, austere measures that have been taken in, uh, in Western economies. Look, even Western economies are, are, are not well equipped to deal with these measures, as we've seen, and they'll produce perhaps some interesting um, and maybe troubling uh, political repercussions in our own countries, in Europe, in the United States, and elsewhere. Um, obviously, you, all that will be magnified to some extent, one would expect, in emerging markets where they don't have the level of, uh, of capacity. All of that, and, and then you sort of add on to that, the fact that, frankly, I think there is a tremendous interest for all countries of the world to ensure that um, basically everyone is able to effectively fight this pandemic, because, of course, um, absent a vaccine, and who knows what the timeline is on a vaccine, suppressing the virus will depend on really suppressing it everywhere, um, since it can travel easily um, on, you know, airplanes and so on and so forth. Um, so that argues for providing international assistance where we can. Um, obviously, you know, I've already talked about all the factors which may sort of prevent us from doing that or may work against doing that, but nevertheless, I think it's actually um, quite important when we sort of weigh helping ourselves against helping others um, we, we should be careful not to actually treat that as a dichotomy, where, in fact, we help others in part because it's good for us as well um, to do so. Um, what will come afterwards, I think, is unknowable. I mean, I, I, I would love to offer a kind of easy answer, but I think that the length of the crisis, the depth of the economic crisis will probably be different from place to place. And I think the political repercussions will be different from place to place. Um, and, you know, um, what the, the way it affects a country like Lebanon will be different from how it affects a country like 
Saudi Arabia, uh, and it'll be dependent not just on how the crisis proceeds, but also sort of the pre-existing conditions, uh, as it were. Um, I think for the Western world, for the United States and Europe, what we need to understand is that um, we have vital interests in this region, um, and that it's important that we step up and help our allies and partners uh, cope with this, um, and that even in places, uh, you know, even in places that are not allies or partners, um, the, the success or failure that they have in terms of dealing with the crisis will, will have some impact on us. Um, and what I think is missing right now is that sense that it is in our interest to help and to help early and not sort of wait for those political repercussions, which are highly uncertain, uh, to happen before we uh, think about helping. Thank you, Michael. Before I, before I give the word to Zine, just I'm going to ask you one final question, and then Zine, you have the last word because you need to wrap up. Michael, um, so Zine underlined earlier that basically what was uh, what was needed in many places is money, yeah, to have to, to frame the response in the first place. Um, is China going to be the one that's going to step in while we are in our bubble? Um, is China going to be the one that comes with bailouts bail uh, with humanitarian assistance? I think so far the answer is no. Um, that generally speaking, the Chinese are not um, uh, willing to come forward with um, humanitarian assistance on the scale that the West has been, has been willing to do historically, um, at least not without very significant uh, political strings attached to it. Uh, I think that the um, greater concern that we should have is that um, the Chinese and, um, uh, well, and I think this is largely good for China, I don't think Russia's in the same position, um, will instead be looking to acquire assets, um, perhaps at discounted prices, uh, as a result of the economic vulnerability of some of these countries. This is a concern, not just frankly in the Middle East, but it's a concern that, um, say, the EU's competitiveness chief has talked about in Europe itself. Uh, the need to um, for states perhaps to take stakes uh, in uh, vital industries, vital companies uh, to prevent the Chinese from doing so. Um, that's something that you know um, wealthy nations can contemplate. I think it's much harder in the case of uh, the Middle East. And so um, that's what I'm worried we might see is an effort to acquire assets, infrastructure assets, key companies, and so on and so forth. Um, in ways that are then very difficult to reverse uh, when times are better. And so we need to think together with our partners in the region about how to head that off. And probably that involves some measure of aid from the West, even though that aid is, uh, is right now scarce and also politically fraught. So I just used three minutes, uh, the first half of it. I'm just going to answer one question. So a public disclaimer. Uh, uh, so the question says, is, am I an analyst or an Algerian opposition member? And they just want to say that I have no affiliation whatsoever with any Algerian or Lebanese or even Middle Eastern opposition uh, uh, groups in the region. And for me, the Algerian government uh, uh, ha has been avoiding excessive force in some occasions, not because uh, they want to protect the people, but because the numbers were huge and they cannot control it if they do fire their guns. For me, that's, uh, that's at least my, my, my belief. So uh, so the second part, I'm just going to take a minute with it, with, it, with it China. I think uh, what we have to look at closely is how this corona crisis will impact the Silk Road project of China and whether it will have the same uh, geopolitical uh, importance and support in the region as it did before. Algeria before signed the contract with the, the memorandum of agreements with China on the Silk Road. How is the corona crisis and China's management of this crisis will uh, impact this, this project? That remains to be seen. But I think uh, China financially wise I doubt it has the, the, the money to cover the whole world and to cover the whole region and the repercussions of this crisis. But even if it does, uh, I think the Europeans and the Western allies of this region are better placed to, to do that sort of help. Uh, because first, the, the, the impact of this crisis will touch uh, Europe and our other allies, not China. Uh, and because, again, uh, they are in a position that allows them to, to intervene, at least unofficially, and at least uh, to support the, the, regions, uh, the region's people. Uh, and for that, so China, the EU, the US, 
I think that that's a battle to be seen. Honestly, uh, we don't have the the whole indications of how this battle will end, but I would say that the Europeans and the Americans have some great chances, at least the way I see it. And they were just close by saying that the both the Algerians and the Lebanese have been staging wonderful protests, civilized protests, uh, for the Lebanese in six months, for the Algerians for over a year. I think it's about time that the international community and the Europeans pay a little attention to these countries and to their struggle for freedom. Because, again, uh, we live in, in a world, in a, in a basically separated world. We have the same destiny, in my opinion. And uh, we, at least I hope, uh, personally, that the Europeans uh, will be able, and the international community will be able to come forward and support this struggle for freedom. And thank you, Christina. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and thanks to Conrad Adenauer and GMF and AJC for this very interesting session for me, at least. Thank you, Zine. I, I, I totally subscribe on your, on, on your last note. And uh, with that, I will join in in thanking everyone. Thank you to, to you two terrific speakers. Thank you to our partners at AJC and at the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. And thank you to you all uh, who you joined us in this. And stay tuned for more. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Good afternoon. Thank you.